let's go. Uh, um, the, uh, the first is going to be an introduction, and I want to introduce everything with the motivational quote from uh, the book by uh, Albert Laszlo Barabasi. The book is called Linked, the New Science of Networks, and the quote goes like this. Networks are present everywhere. All we need is an eye for them. And uh, that's sort of the reason I enjoy networks, and that's why that's one of the reasons I study networks, right? And I'll show you a couple of nice pictures, you know, because I'm a mathematician, I can't help myself but show something related to Erdos. So uh, if you are doing mathematics, then you know who Erdos is. And uh, this is his collaboration network. So that's one of the example of networks that are present everywhere. It's a network of collaboration of a very famous Erdos. Uh, there are networks that are associated with, um, uh, let me just drag it down. There are networks that are associated with uh, various social interactions. And here is the uh, graph of the social interaction in a, of movie characters. And this is the movie called Forrest Gump. I hope that you, even though there's a lot of young people, I, know, I hope you know what this movie is. If you don't, check it out. It's really cool. Um, there is also um, networks that we can use to represent various other relationships. This is an example of something that we called Krebs network. It's a quite famous instance of a, a social network and it's an interaction of the people involved in the 9-11 uh, tragedy in the United States, the so-called 9-11 hijackers and so on. So uh, another network that I want to show you is the network of um, uh, relationships between dolphins. So this is in uh, uh, Doubtful Sound Bay in New Zealand. There, are six, there is a group of 62 uh, bottlenose dolphins. They live in that bay. And uh, when they are seen interacting with each other on multiple occasions, then the uh, link represents that interaction. So on this graph, uh, the blue nodes are male dolphins. The pink ones are the female dolphins. The ones that are green are the dolphins whose gender we don't know because they're young and we just don't know what gender they are. And also the size of this, uh, uh, of the nodes represents the centrality. So I'm gonna go get into this idea of centrality and the measure, to, to say a few words about it uh, as a means of introduction, I'll just mention that centrality is one of the measures of importance, right? So within the network, within the, uh, especially when it comes to social networks, one of the questions that we're interested in is, how important are certain elements of that network? In our case, how important certain nodes are. And one of the measures of the importance is the measure of centrality. And there is, there is actually a whole bunch of them. It's a group of measures, and I'll focus on one of them, one of those measures of centrality. And again, as a means of introduction, I'm going to briefly say a few things about what we mean by graphs in this particular paper, in this particular work so that we're all on the same page in terms of notation and uh, terminology. So we are concerned with undirected graphs, which means that the direction between, you know, which way are we, which way the link is pointing is irrelevant. Uh, we represent graphs as a pair of sets. First set V is the set of nodes or vertices, and the second set E is the set of edges. And like I said, they are undirected. So a small example of a, Undirected graph is this one on the slide, five nodes, uh, what is it, six uh, edges. And uh, there are certain assumptions that we make in everything that we do. One of the assumptions is that we have at most one edge from node I to node J, which means that there are no multiple edges. And if you're working with graphs, you know that this means that we're working with simple graphs. So there is not, these are not multi-graphs. We also, like I said, assume that the edge ij and ji are the same, so the direction is irrelevant. There are no loops. We don't allow for the self loops, so edges of the type ii don't exist. And we also assume that the graphs we're working with are connected. So there is a path that exists between any pair of nodes. These are our assumptions. Now, what we are interested in the graphs are the walks. Right, and I'll motivate this as soon, as soon as I describe what we what we mean by the walks. I will motivate why we're interested in these types of walks. So 
There are several different types of walks that we can define on any undirected connected graph. The first one is something we call just a walk, and that's simply a sequence, a finite sequence of nodes. The only condition is that the consecutive nodes in that sequence have an edge between them. So it's literally a walk. You're starting with a node and you start walking. You go forward and then backward and then sideways and you keep going like that. All right, so that's what we call a walk. Now, a slightly more restricted version of a walk is called a trail. The difference between a walk and a trail is that trail has no repeated edges. You cannot traverse the same edge more than once. Now, the next restriction it brings us to something called a simple path. In some literature, it's referred to as a simple path. In some literature, it's called just a path. I'll use the parentheses here. So the difference between the trail and the path is that a path has no repeated nodes, right? So in a walk, you can repeat edges and nodes. In a trail, you can repeat nodes, but not edges. And then in a path, you cannot repeat anything. And there is something called an induced path. So an induced path is a slightly more restricted version of a path which has no shortcuts, doesn't allow any shortcuts. So a couple of examples here on this little graph that I have on the slide, the sequence one, two, three, one, and four, right? So I went back to node one and then to node four. This thing is a trail, but not a simple path. So it's a trail because I have come back to the same node one, twice. I haven't used uh, an edge more than once, but it's not a simple path because I repeated the node. Similarly, um, a sequence one, two, three, and five, one, two, three, and five. So this is a simple path, but it's not an induced path. It's not an induced path because between nodes one and three, there exists a shortcut, right? I went one, two, three, five, but there is a shortcut between one and three, and therefore the condition for the induced path has been violated. If you're curious why I'm interested in all these different types, they all have applications. They're all very important for various applications. There is a lot of stuff where we need all of these things, right? So that's why I'm interested in this. One of the applications for the type of problems we um, study come from humanitarian uh, problems, humanitarian logistics, and the rescue operations. And I'll, I'll talk to them, I'll talk about them in a minute when I show a big, a big picture. Now, I also wanna get into an extension of the idea of a centrality and in particular degree centrality. So I said earlier that one of the measures of an importance of an element in a graph, in particular node, is the centrality of that node. Um, there are, a, there are different, there is a bunch of different measures of centrality. The one we're going to focus on is called degree centrality. So I will introduce that. And before that, I'll do a few more things, right? So the first thing that we do, we use dij to denote the distance between nodes i and j. The distance between two nodes is simply the number of hops between them, the number of edges that between them. So it's actually the length of the shortest path between the two nodes. We also talk about a neighborhood of a node. The neighborhood of a node is simply the number of its neighbors. It's the cardinality of the set of neighbors. Now, the degree of a node is simply the number of neighbors that it has, right? And then the degree centrality of a node is simply its degree. So when you talk about the degree centrality, like in that picture with dolphins, Right? The degree centrality of each individual node is simply how many neighbors it's got, how many dolphins is it connected to. It's very simple, or very intuitive concepts, right? And the idea here is that the more nodes you're connected to directly, the more central you are from the degree centrality point of view, and hence more important you are, right? And like I said, there are other measures of centrality, but we are focusing on a simple one here. There are two actually definitions of degree centrality. The one that says it's just the number of neighbors, it's just the degree of a node. And then another one actually weighs that by the total number of nodes in the system. Uh, they are equivalent for our purposes. We're gonna use the first one because it's just simpler, but in, in principle, they're equivalent definitions. So that's the centrality of a node. 
Now I'm going to start making extensions to these things because the centrality of a node and the importance of an element such as node in the network using centrality, these are the things that have been studied extensively. Now we're interested in the centrality of group of nodes. So not just a node by itself, but some group. So we want to extend the definition of centrality to the centrality of a group. The way we're going to do it is this. Again, very intuitive. We're going to say that we will consider a group of nodes S in a graph. And we'll say that the neighborhood of that group is all the nodes that are adjacent to the group. Right? You might think, oh, you can just sum up all the neighborhoods of individual groups. It's not really quite that simple because some members of the group can have overlapping neighborhoods. So it's not just a summation of the centrality measures. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But overall, the idea is very simple. The degree centrality of a group is simply the size of its immediate neighborhood. Right? And that definition is consistent because if group S turns out to be a singleton, which, which means that it's a single node, then the degree centrality of a group reduces to the degree centrality of a node. Right? So this is all my preliminaries that I wanted to show. Now I'm going to go into the type of problems that we're actually interested in. We're interested in finding different types of walks in a graph that have high or highest degree centrality. Right? So here's an example of a simple graph. And I have a walk with the centrality being 17. So the walk is the red nodes with the arcs indicating which way am I going. So I'm starting with this no red node here and I'm moving up, doing this triangle coming back and ending up here. All the green nodes indicate the neighborhood. So these are the so-called covered nodes by my walk. I also have examples of a trail in the same graph, path, induced path, and the shortest path. Why are these interesting? So imagine a situation where you have a, uh, an emergency site, right? Let's say there is an earthquake and uh, it's a city and a lot of things are destroyed and you want to evacuate people and you have a point and you want to decide what's the route of evacuation. You want to come in to that site and you want to have a point of entry, the route and an exit point. The route needs to have certain constraints, right? You want the route that, for example, doesn't have any repeating nodes. You don't want to repeat the same nodes as you're coming through that city that's been destroyed and you want to collect people. But the idea of having large neighborhood is your proxy to how many people you actually can collect from those points, right? So my red nodes, for example, are the places where uh, an evacuation truck is going to stop and those who are in the immediate neighborhood can jump onto it and I keep going. That's the first idea. Another idea where these things are interesting is the idea of delivery of goods or packages or maybe something else. Uh, there's also military applications of these things, but I'm not going to talk much about the military stuff today. So imagine again a truck that carries some goods and the delivery is done using drones that are sitting on the truck, right? So every time the truck stops, the drones come up, deliver to the neighborhood, come back, sit back on the truck, the truck moves to the next stop, same idea, right? So in all of these situations, you want a route that has a very large neighborhood, right? The larger the neighborhood, the more effective is that route from the point of view of this application. So that's why we're looking at these problems. And we're looking at all of these different types of problems because we're interested in knowing whether, first of all, they are difficult to solve or not. Do they have the same complexity or not? And the second question is, if they have different complexity, can I use solutions to some as approximations to the other? Are there are some types of these problems that are easier to solve than others and so on? Right, so these are my questions. It will turn out. I'll show you that the solutions to the shortest path type of problem, the problem where I'm looking for a path with the largest neighborhood, but the condition that I give to the path, that that's the shortest path between the beginning and the end. Right? That problem turns out to be easy to solve, polynomial. Everybody else, every other problem is NP-hard. 
right? It's it's on you. It's uh, yeah. Now I've got your attention. <laughs> okay. So there is one more thing, one more visualization that I want to show you, and that's the fact that the definitions of these different types of walks or different types of paths they are nested in a sense, right? So the the most general is a is a walk this is where all you need is connections between nodes but you can repeat the edges you can repeat the nodes themselves so you can go back and forth and you are free to do that so that's the most general setting the most restricted setting is where you you get to walk but the beginning at the and the end of your walk right so you know you know the beginning you know the end and then as you walk that path has to constitute a shortest path and I'm going to often use this statement, a shortest path, as opposed to the, the shortest path, because in lots of real life instances, there are multiple shortest paths between a pair of nodes. In fact, there are instances where the number of shortest paths between a pair of nodes can be exponentially large. And I'll show you an example of that, right? So again, I want you to open your mind and stop thinking of a shortest path as being the shortest path, because it's, the length of it is the shortest but the path itself is a because there can be a ton of them so and the nesting goes this way okay now because of this nested structure and because of the results that we got we will start with the most degree central shortest path problem right because that problem happens to be polynomially solvable and there is an algorithm that uh, uh, i'll present that does that so this problem, I'm going to carefully state the problem now, right? This problem can be stated in two different ways. One way of stating it is for a fixed start and end point, for a fixed ST pair. Another way of stating a problem is for the gen generally for the whole graph, right? So you're looking for a path which is shortest between this st start and the end and has the largest neighborhood for the whole graph. So... In the first instance where I start, the, I state the problem as given a graph G and a pair of nodes S and T find a shortest ST path with the highest degree centrality. That's the so-called local version of the problem because it will give me uh, a local property of the graph. I'll know what that path is and how big of a neighborhood it can cover. The alternative statement where I'm simply saying, given a graph G, find a shortest path with the highest degree centrality, that means that I don't really care what the beginning and the end are. I let these things flow, right? I let the system determine which, which one is the start, which one is the end. The thing that I want is that the path be shortest between whatever beginning and end happens to be. And also it has the highest degree centrality of all shortest paths in the graph between any pair of nodes. That's, that's, that's going to give me a global property of the graph. Yeah, make sense? Okay. So, and like I said, this problem isn't as simple as you might imagine because it turns out that I can construct instances of graphs where the number of shortest paths between a beginning and the end, and here I'm fixing them, right? So my beginning is node one, my end is node 16. And in this structure, I've got two to the power of five shortest paths between one and 16. There's a lot of them. And they're all of the same length. They all have the same degree centrality in this specific example, right? The degree centrality will be five of any shortest path you can draw between one and 16, right? And they all have obviously the same length because they're shortest. So I can generalize this statement and I can construct graphs with three n plus one nodes, right? Similar structure. And with these graphs, the number of shortest paths between the beginning, the first node and the last node will be two to the n. So that's my proof that these things can grow exponentially. Now, despite the fact that they grow exponentially, so the reason it's important is this, simply, evaluating every single shortest path between a pair of nodes and then checking their neighborhood and then saying, oh, here's the one with the largest neighborhood is not a good idea because just evaluating them will take you an exponential amount of time, right? Because there is an exponential number of them. So we need to be smarter. And that brings us to the algorithm. So the algorithm has this fundamental idea behind it. And the idea is this, it's in the proposition one. 
Suppose I've got a path P that starts with some node P0 and ends in the node PK, right? So the length of that path is K. So I have K hops, right? Edges, we count the size, the length of the path using the number of edges. The source node, the beginning, right? This is P0. So my source is the node S equal to P0 and the end node is T. So PK is T. The distance between these two nodes is K. And I want the K to be at least three. So I don't want the trivial situations where the length is only two, for example. I want it to be three or more. Now it turns out that for any two nodes or from that path, PA and PB, so I've got an index A here in an index B, and these indices, they are any index of the path, right? So they range from zero to K. As long as these indices are at least three away from each other, the corresponding neighborhoods do not overlap. Because if they did overlap, then it wouldn't be a shortest path. Right? Proof is very, very straightforward, very simple. But the idea is that the neighborhoods of the individual nodes in the shortest path, whose indices are at least two apart, at least three apart, they do not overlap. Now we can extend this idea to the concept of the neighborhoods of the subpaths, right? So here I introduced the new notation: this L minus one index for the path indicates that I'm only looking at those nodes of the path that go until L, right? So it's part of it. It's the beginning and then from L to K, that's the end. And it turns out that the neighborhoods of the sub paths won't overlap under the same condition, right? That I'm cutting it with uh, at least three indices apart. So now, because the, the, the subpath at the beginning, right, until A and after B, those two have no elements in the neighborhood in common, I can now do a very, very cool thing. I can now build this, I can now use this idea to build my subpaths, right? So check this out. The proposition that I have here says the following. Again, suppose that I have nodes S and T and I have two, two shortest paths between them. They start from the same node, then they've got a whole bunch of nodes that are different. And then they have from node L minus one, they are the same, right? So the beginning up until something is different and then the rest is the same. Now it turns out that these two paths are the, their centralities will differ in the way the subpath centralities are different. In other words, the size of the neighborhood of one path of P prime is greater or equal to the size of the neighborhood of P double prime, if and only if the size of the neighborhood of the first L elements of the P prime is greater or equal to the, basically we only have to look at the parts that are not the same. Everything else we can ignore. Right? Because that's what's going to determine the difference in their corresponding neighborhoods. Now, that allows me to build the algorithm. I know it may be a bit too much, but the idea is this. I'm going to build my shortest path sequentially, and I'm going to start with a node S, and I'm going to create shortest paths of length 1, 2, 3, four and so on. And I'm gonna build these layers of shortest paths, right? And layers of nodes. And every time I build them, I'm gonna look at whether the paths of let's say length five, they've got all the nodes the same or not, right? And I'm only gonna keep those where the difference is at least two nodes at the end. So that allows me to not have to look at all possible paths in the system, all right? This idea that I can only look at things that have preceded. I've looked at them, I pruned, and I move on to the next level, all right? I understand that this is a lot of information and I don't expect you to fully grasp everything that is here. I'm happy to discuss the details, but the main idea is that because the neighborhoods of the 
subpaths don't overlap, I can prune some of them and not consider. And that allows me to have very effective algorithm. The complexity of this algorithm is polynomial. We have a proof that the worst case running time of this algorithm is of the order of k n to the four. k here is the distance between the beginning and the end. Right? And the worst case memory complexity of this algorithm is on the order of n cube. What that means is that if I can solve this problem for a fixed beginning and a fixed end in polynomial time, it means that I can also solve the, the uh, problem for all possible beginning and end in polynomial time. It's going to be slightly more complicated. So if I go for the whole graph, this grows to kn to the six, but it's still polynomial. So the main result here is that the most degree central shortest path problem is polynomial time solvable. And I want to show you a little bit of computational results on these are synthetic graphs. We've chosen two types. There is a type called, these are, these are randomly generated graphs using specific uh, generating models. One of them is called Barabasi Albert model. The other one is called Watts Strogatz. The reason we picked these two because they are known to be good representations of social networks and, and things related to them. So they're good ways of randomly generating social network-like graphs. They are of size 100, 500, and 1,000 nodes, corresponding size of edges. They're, they're not very dense, right? These things are not very dense because social networks are not very dense graphs. So these are, the second line here is the size, is the size of this set of edges, how many edges are in the graph like that. And then the diameter here and the diameter centrality, these are two interesting things because the diameter is the length of the longest shortest path in the graph, right? So a graph has a whole bunch of origin destination pairs, a whole bunch of STs. Each of these STs has a, particular length of the shortest path. And the diameter is the longest of all of them. So the reason this diameter is fractional is because these results are for 30 randomly generated, yeah, 30 randomly generated instances for each set of parameters. So this is an average out of 30. Because I'm in the department where there's a lot of statisticians. So I need to do things that statisticians will uh, appreciate. Now, the diameter centrality is an important thing here because it allows us to say what will be the centrality of a diameter, right? If I, I can find diameter very quickly, its centralities are given here, averages again. And then the path length and the path centrality, these are the length of the most central shortest path and its corresponding centrality. So you will see that actually they differ and uh, you don't have to or you shouldn't look at the diameter at the longest uh, shortest path to find something which is the most central. And the larger the graph, the differences grow. And the run, run, last thing is the runtime in seconds. So I can say here that within, uh, let's say, an hour, I can solve instances with 1,000 nodes and 2,000 edges. That's a lot. With this type of problems, it's a lot. So I, you know, my algorithm is indeed polynomial, and uh, even though the degree is six, but still I can do things fairly quickly. Everything okay so far? Because now I'm going to go into some more sophisticated stuff. Can you make scale free? If it's easy to generate, so so the Barabasi Albert model has this. It's a model, uh, it, so the scale-free is a specific of that model. So the model generates something called scale-free networks. What it means is that um, when you start, you, you start by creating a uh, triangle. So it's a simplex, you've got three nodes and they're connected between each other. And then you flip, a, you, cre you create another node and you flip a coin and you decide to which nodes this one is gonna be attached to, right? And then you create another node, you flip a coin and you make that decision as well. So the result is the network that has this so-called scale-free property. It's just the name of the property of the way, it's the property of the distribution of the degrees of the nodes resulting, right? So it's got, so the scale-free doesn't mean, 
well, I don't know what it reminds you of, but uh, what it actually, what, what it means is that you've got, you've got this sort of a um, Pareto-like uh, distribution of um, uh, no degrees. No, it is a distribution of degree centralities in a sense, yeah. because the degree centrality is simply the degrees of the individual nodes, right? You really have to divide the degrees into something. Yeah. No. Anyway, it's just it it's just the way um, yeah. um, they call it, the resulting distribution of the centralities. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of things on, this, on the individual uh, instances of real life. So basically in the, in the area of social networks and everything is uh, analysis of graphs that is kind of next to social networks, which is part of what we do. There is a group of uh, real life instances that people typically work on. And they are the so-called dolphins network that I spoke about earlier, the crabs, and then there's a bunch of others. So I'm present I have a subset of the things that are typically being studied. And I describe what they are. And the reason we picked this particular subset is because they grow in size. So the dolphins and crabs, they have 62 nodes each. Then Sandy Waters, 86. Santa Fe, one, 118. US Air, 97 has 300 and something. And then so we grow. Basically, I just want real life instances that grow in size. And I run the same algorithm on them and I get the computational results. And you'll see that the network, which is called Cerevisi, which is the, uh, it's the largest connected component of a biological network of a protein. It's a very specific yeast and the, this protein connections within it. So it's biology, right? So it has about 1500 uh, nodes, about 2000 edges. We can solve this problem in under 5,000 seconds, which is good. It's great for this type of problems. It's very good. So that's the result. Now let's look at some other stuff because I said that other things are much more complicated. So the first theorem that we have is the, th is the result on the complexity of other types of most degree central walks. Remember that walks, trails, paths, induced paths. Right? Shortest path is polynomial. The other are all in P hard. I'm not showing the whole proof because it's a few pages. The idea is that in our proof, we are reducing the maximum coverage problem to our problem. The maximum coverage is known to be NP complete. As soon as we show the reduction, then we state that our problem is also NP complete. Uh, we do the proof in our paper for the most degree central walk, which is the most general type of problem. But then the proof is easily adaptable to everything else the trail, the simple path, and the induced path problem. So they all NP complete, which means that we need to do something to be able to solve them, right? Because this is still interesting. So how do we solve them? We propose MIP formulations for them. There is no algorithm that we can come up with, the NP complete. So let's see what we can do with MIPs. A bit of, um, again, notation here, just so that we're on the same page, right? So we've got these funny brackets with, a, with a, a parameter inside that denote a set of integers from zero to that parameter. Or if there is a plus, it means that we don't consider zero, we only do the the positive integers. E with a hat is the set of um, edges. So you know how in our graphs, edges are the same, whether it's ij or ji, but for the modeling with MIPs, we need both pairs because that's the way it's easier to model that way. And then we've got three, sorry, three sets of variables. The variables u, i, j, t are associated with edges and when they are being traversed. I'll talk about the when in a second because that's the top two statements. The xit is the binary variable that is associated with the vertex i being visited at time t during this walk. And the yi is binary variable, which is one if the node i is adjacent to the walk. Basically yi's indicate the neighborhood XIT, the walk itself, and UIJT are the edges of the walk, right? Variables, now two ideas. So we, we're presenting two different formulations. One of them is that we say, let's think of the walk as the actual walk, right? So I get a network and I start from node I at some point zero, and then I make a step to one of the neighbors. 
and that's when time period one. And then I, from there, I step to some other neighbor, that's time period two, and I do that, right? So that's the idea of the first, uh, of the way we model it first, uh, in the first instance. And then in the second instance, instead of visiting vertices, we are modeling it as if we were visiting edges. So the main variable will be edges. And I'll show you what the differences are. In both cases, we want to restrict the length of the walk, right? With the shortest path, we didn't have that because the shortest path is the shortest path, you can't go any further. With these guys, you can make a walk as long as you want. And it can be infinite because there are no restrictions. You can visit the same node multiple times, right? Same edges multiple times. So now one of the parameters in my modeling is the length of that. So I'm gonna look at walks of a particular length. And then I'll keep increasing that length. So let's have a look. The first formulation, I said it, this IMIP, right? We're gonna look at the edge traversing formulation. I wanna start with the edge traversing because it turns out that the vertex traversing are better, right? So first I'll present you something which is not as good. And then I'll say, ah, here, here is a better one, right? So the ones that are not as good are the ones that are based on the edge traversing formulation. Our main variable is UIJ T, right? The variable that corresponds to the edge that is being visited at time T. And the constraints are very trivial, right? One edge at a time, only adjacent edges, the neighbors of the walk, right? The UI variables, they're restricted by looking at which edge was actually traversed. And the walk vertices, are not being counted in the neighborhood. So when I count the neighborhood, I don't count the actual vertices that I visited. I only count the ones that are adjacent to it because there is an alternative definition of the neighborhood, which includes the vertices of the set itself. But we're not doing that here, right? So everything is straightforward in this formulation. And wh why is this formulation interesting? Well, because from walk to a trail, all I need is just one additional set of constraints that tell me that I can't visit a edge more than once, right? That's it. So they're very compact. Turns out, like I said, they are prohibitive because they're difficult. They don't scale very quickly. They, they are okay for smaller problems, but they're not okay for larger problems. And also formulating the uh, path and an induced path with this type of variables is a little bit harder. So we are proposing a different one, which is called the vertex visiting formulation. And here the main variable is X, I, T, because this indicates the vertex that I visited, right? And again, same idea, one vertex at each time, moving through adjacent vertices only, the neighborhood is constrained by being only those that are part of the, uh, that are actually neighbors. And then the, the vertices of the walk itself are not counted in the, in the Y's, they're not the neighbors, right? So that's the alternative formulation. Again, I don't expect you to remember everything. I'm just gonna, sh I'm just showing you that things are actually quite easy. Like they're not, we're not doing anything. It's not very, the constraints are not very sophisticated. They are quite elegant. Uh, I can add a few more constraints to get to the trail. And you can see that now, because my main variable is X and I need to restrict visiting of edges, I have no choice but introduce the edge variables here again. And that's why we call it like this abbreviation here at the top, FTVE, vertex edge, as opposed to here, vertex based. And the W and the T here, they stand for uh, walk versus trail. And then later on, we get into the path. Again, just one additional set of constraints, very elegant. And then the uh, induced path, one more set of constraints. So they're nested. Remember I showed you that big picture, they're nested, right? And the formulations are nested as well. It's very nice, very elegant stuff. So let's look at the way they perform, right? So here we're using a, an off the shelf solver. The solver is um, Gurobi. And uh, in that solver, we set everything to be default. We're not fiddling with, with any of the parameters except for the duration for the time limit and the number of threads. So everything is solved on a single thread here. So we're not doing, because parallelizing creates a lot of disturbance in the way the results, uh, uh, in the performance of the algorithms. 
So single thread, uh, two hours time limit. Now, how do you read the results? The first bit is on Barabasi-Albert instances. The second bit, uh, so both of them are on Barabasi-Albert, sorry. The first bit are the runtimes and the second bit are the, um, these are quality of the LP relaxations, right? So basically we wanna know how tight is the initial LP relaxation of the problem so that we know what drives the complexity, right? Why, why things are difficult to solve. So here in the second table, we are looking at the difference between the uh, value of the objective function at the root node uh, minus the uh, optimal divided by the optimal. So it's a relative MIP gap at the root. Again, these are all averages across 30 instances. Um, when, in, when everything is 30 instances, right? So in, uh, the first column tells you the length of the path we want. We want path length four to 14. We stopped at 14 because things become really hard at 14 and it kind of doesn't make sense to go any further, All right? What do I mean by these things in, in brackets with the uh, superscript? Things in brackets are a relative uh, MIP gap for those instances that were not solved to optimality within two hours. So if two hours passes and I don't have an optimal solution, I'm looking at the gap. And then the superscript here tells me how many instances were there out of the 30. So 14 for Barabasi, the walk edge-based formulation, two instances we could solve, and the average runtime happens to be about 1800 of those two. 28 instances ran out of time with an average optimality gap of 4.8%. That's why I say they become very difficult. It's 100 nodes, path of length 14 I want. And after two hours, I don't know what the best thing is. Yeah? So that's, that's what's happening here. Uh, the conclusion from these uh, results you can make is that solving a simple path is the easiest of all these problems. Even though it's anti-complete, it's the easiest because I don't run out of time, right? I can do 14 in about 330 seconds on average. That's the conclusion. And that is, you can see, look, you can look at it at the level of the um, uh, relative optimality gap for, the, uh, for this root relaxation. You will see that for the path, after solving the root, you're about 2% away from the optimum. Whereas in others, you can be up to 40% away from the optimum, which takes you forever to actually close that gap and, and, and so on. So that's the idea here. Uh, hold on. Similar story goes with the what's, what's Strogatz type of graphs. Again, we run out of steam very quickly with the same size, 100 nodes, path of length eight, I don't solve anything within two hours using the walk and edge-based formulation, right? Everything is uh, out of time, 32% on average optimality gap. It's very hard. These ones are very hard. The walk-based formula, sorry, the vertex-based formulations, they're better, but still. And as before, solving a problem for a path, for a simple path is easier. That's the idea. Now, this is the slide that gives you a bit of an insight. What can I do, right? So the problems themselves are really hard, but path seems to be a simpler problem to solve. And the shortest path is polynomial. Now, can I use, they're the nested, right? The solution to a shortest path problem is feasible for everybody else because it's the most restricted. And therefore I can plug it into here, into here, into here, into here. It's not gonna be the best, but it gives me an approximation. The problem with the shortest path is that they don't exist for certain values of T, right? So for example, for the barabasi albert graphs, on average, the shortest path, the diameter is 5.6. So there are only few graphs that have a shortest path of the, long, of the length six. Once you go below, beyond that, I can't use it anymore. So I need something else if I wanna solve a walk or a trail. And these graphs, this table tells you that path solutions because they're easy to easier to get they can be used for the walk and the trail problem they are not always ideal but very often they are because the differences in the in the corresponding covers are very small so here are my conclusions and observations here 
is that the shortest path provides a good approximation for the other problems if it exists, but very quickly we run out of shortest paths of that length. The induced path provides good approximations for the simple path trail and walk. And uh, simple path is an excellent approximation for more difficult problems, which are trail and walk. So we can use them if we need to solve problems of this sort. But that's not all we can do. We can also do heuristics, right? One of the things that we learn to do as we're doing optimization is that if the problem is very difficult, we can try and approximate it, right? One way of approximating is this, is plugging in solutions to other problems. But again, they're quite prohibitive still because the problems are difficult to solve. Now, what can I do with heuristics? With heuristics, I can do a lot of stuff. One thing I can do is I can be greedy and I can say, let's start with a walk of length one, look at its sides, right? Look, walk of length one includes only two nodes. So I can pick the most central pair of nodes that have an edge between them, it's not difficult. And then I will be looking at the neighbors of each of these nodes from the be beginning of the walk and the end of the walk. And between all of the neighbors, I'll choose the one with the highest degree centrality or the one that gives me the highest improvement or the largest improvement in the degree centrality of my resulting walk. It's not a difficult thing to do. It's actually quite cool. And I will continue doing this iteratively until I reach the desired length of the resulting walk, right? So once again, I start with, with the walk of length one, and then I look at the one end of it. Who can I add that will improve my degree centrality the most? Who can I add from the other side who improves the degree centrality the most? Pick the best, get a new walk, and repeat the process again by looking at the endpoints, right? The main drawback of this strategy is that it's very myopic. I don't see beyond just the neighbors. And that results in actually pretty poor performance, you will see in a minute. In a minute. So I can adjust. The way I'm gonna adjust is by doing the same thing, but instead of looking at the neighbors that improve my degree centrality the most, I'm gonna look at the endpoint neighbors who have the highest closeness centrality. That's another way of measuring centrality, sophisticated formulas and whatever. I'm not gonna dwell on that, but I'm just saying that I can pick a more sophisticated measure. We've tried with two. We've tried with something which is called harmonic centrality, and something which is called decay centrality. They're all based on the distances between everybody else in the network and that node, right? The formulas, you can dig into them and see what they are. I have a paper ready, you're welcome to read it. But the idea here is simple. And I want to sort of uh, uh, convey the main idea. The main idea is instead of looking at the degree centrality of the resulting uh, graph or uh, resulting uh, path, look at other type of centrality score, and in particular, closeness centrality. And you will see that it improves performance very, quite dramatically. So here, here are the results, right? We're using some of the, in this case, I'm presenting the results on the real life instances, right? So the instance called Dolphins, Sandy Authors, IEEE bus. All you need to know about them is that they have a particular size, right? So 62, 86, and 111 nodes. And here I am presenting the results again for some length of the path that I want. And in this case, I'm looking for a walk, right? The most general thing. The optimal size of the neighborhood of a walk. So I can find the walk of length 16 in the graph called dolphins. That's going to have 45 neighbors. And that's the best I can do for the walk of the length 16, right? And then the rest of the columns are the results of my heuristic. The first one is the greedy one. The greedy heuristic will give me 42 nodes in the neighborhood. And then the uh, second, the improved heuristic with different measures of centrality. So the first one is the harmonic and then the other two are the, uh, um, the decay centrality with different parameters, right? They improve quite dramatically. So you will see later that, for example, for the larger graphs, such as Sandy authors, I'm improving from the greedy heuristic, giving me 43 to 47, 51, with the 54 being the optimal result. All of this can be done in under a second. So the times I'm 
giving here, they are the times, they are the total combined running times of all my heuristics together. And I run each of them like 10 times because there is a bit of randomness in the way I choose certain things. And all of that can be done very, very quickly. So the heuristics are good. They give me good approximations. Okay. And then the last bit that I want to say is this, that I can also use my heuristics as warm starts for the MIP. You know the idea of a warm start right, for the MIP problems. And I can use the heuristic solutions to warm start my MIPs. And when I do that, again, here the, I'm trying to do it with a walk. And I'm showing you the performance walk by itself, walk with the warm start. And as a warm start, I get the best of all the heuristics I can run, right? The best solution I can run. There's a question? What is the warm start? So um, in short is this, when you start an MIP uh, solver, right? The first idea is to find the first feasible integer solution for a problem that you're trying to solve, right? And it may take a while. Warm start is when I give the system the first solution to start working with it cuts a lot of time, right? In most cases, but in some cases it doesn't. So, and the reason I say sometimes it doesn't is this, these times in the column called difference, they are the difference in the run time between working cold and working with the warm start. And sometimes these differences are negative which means that once, why, and once I have given the, full, the warm start to my solver, it actually took longer because the warm start pushed it in the wrong direction. Right? That's the rough idea. And then the last column on this table gives me the percentage difference in terms of the time. Right? So I, sometimes I save time, sometimes I don't. The conclusion here is this. Because heuristics are so cheap in terms of the time, I should still do that. And solving this problem, I can solve it in parallel. I can do one without, one with, and see which one wins. That's the strategy, yeah. Couple of words about the conclusions. Conclusions are pretty obvious. First, the most degree central walk problem is very hard in general. So walk, trail, simple path, induced path, very, very hard. The version which requires the path or the walk to be actually a shortest path, it actually can be solved in polynomial time and we have the results. The solution of the most degree central shortest path can be used as an approximation for everybody else. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. The solutions of others can be used in this nested way. Right? And also we can use very simple heuristics to generate high quality solutions. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions if you have them.